Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's event, Petrochemicals Without the Petro. Um, my name is Ed Ryder, and I'm the director of ITIF's Center for Clean Energy Innovation. I'll kick off this session in a few minutes with uh, a bit of a brief, and then Henry's going to pick things up from there. But let me give some instructions first. Um, each panelist will um, respond to the findings that Henry mentions. And to submit questions to the speakers, please use the available Slido link. If you're watching on our web page, you can find the Slido link in the event summary. If you're watching on YouTube or on our social media, you can find the link in the event description. So thanks everyone for joining uh, us today for this discussion. The event will be recorded and can be found on ITIF's website immediately following the presentation. Uh, so with that, if you would go to the next slide, please. Uh, just a quick note about ITIF. ITF is the world's top think tank for science and technology policy, uh, independent, nonpartisan, and also nonprofit. Next slide. Um, within ITIF, uh, the Center for Clean Energy Innovation focuses on innovation at the interfaces between policy, technology, and business. Next slide, please. Um, today, I after this introduction, we'll bring up uh, Henry Kelly from Boston University, who will present the main uh, findings from his report, which again, you can also find on the website. Uh, we'll then uh, bring up Ellie uh, Simon from Siemens and Ram, uh, Ram Prasad from uh, 12, and then Felicia Lushi from DOE. Next slide, please. So let me mention the importance of uh, this area I, as petrochemicals accounts for about 37% of the industrial uh, emissions. And those industrial emissions account for some 30% of the nation's CO2 emissions. So it's very important that we find additional ways to reduce those emissions. Next slide. This is particularly important uh, as more than 30% of the technologies that are gonna be needed to reduce these emissions are in the demonstration or in the prototype stage uh, today. So uh, the technologies that Henry is gonna discuss shortly are gonna be very important to reducing those emissions. Next slide. And the one after this. Let me hand it over to Henry at this point. Uh, he's going to tell you about uh, the findings from this report. <clears throat> Thanks, Ed. Uh, and appreciate being here. And Ed has explained why petrochemicals are important. But uh, they proved to be particularly tr intractable in trying to figure out how to make ch changes that can help us with uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But the importance of petrochemicals is driven by two, two things then. And one is that there's a hugely growing demand for plastics and other materials. There seems to be no limit to how much we need. Uh, but second, their production seems to be unsuited to electrification. But what I'm going to be doing here today is to try to convince you that there really are options to do that. So can I take, the, uh, take a look at the next slide? I'm sorry. Yes. So it's, uh, these two factors are drive, making the you know, petrochemicals one of the drivers of the future of, of fossil fuel industry. Uh, and next slide. But tracking the emissions of, pla of plastics and other petrochemicals turns out to be incredibly complicated. And there are at least three different issues here. One, of course, is the production, transportation, and storage of the raw materials in the US, mostly natural gas. Second is the emissions associated with the production process itself. Um, and that's where carbon capture technologies can play a major role. I'm not going to discuss those since they're well treated uh, elsewhere. But third, uh, the emissions associated with the use and disposal of pressure chemicals is important because unlike uh, most manufacturing, 60% of the fossil fuel uh, used in the production of plastic ends up embedded in the plastic itself. Plastics are, in effect, uh, another form of, uh, of fossil fuels. Now, some plastics, of course, last forever, uh, centuries. In But it turns out that we don't know a lot about the actual lifetime of many chemicals in many different environments where they may end up. 
Uh, some of them last only for a few decades. Uh, and of course, biodegradable materials are designed to last a year or less. Uh, all of these end up dumping the, the fossil carbon back into the atmosphere. Next slide. And you're undoubtedly familiar with, it, with some of the techniques uh, that are being used to uh, substitute for uh, fossil fuels as a raw material. Uh, and these are certainly going to make major contributions, but they all face major constraints. Um, in the case of biomass, there's limited amounts of material that can be produced without creating environmental problems or uh, unacceptable threats to food production. And there's a huge demand for their uh, for this material in making uh, uh, renewable aircraft fuels and other things. Plastic recycling faces an enormous challenge in just collecting this stuff. And most of the products made with recycling are either significantly inferior to the uh, raw, uh, the original plastic material, or they release uh, a significant amount of fossil fuel of, of greenhouse gases in the process. Uh, some of the, there are advanced chemical techniques that may make this much easier. But it goes without saying that even if the plastics are made with renewable uh, uh, sources, uh, recovering the material and preventing it from entering the environment is, is going to be important. The next slide. But what I'm going to focus on today is producing petrochemicals directly from water and carbon dioxide and processes powered either by electricity or directly by sunlight. And half of this process is already a part of a major national hydrogen initiative that has a huge focus on using electric, uh, electric chemical cells like the one shown here to produce uh, hydrogen from water. What's been missing is the part where you try to uh, take uh, carbon from CO2 and make complex chemicals. Next slide. Now the fundamental process doesn't seem like rocket science. You begin with water, which is an oxygen and two hydrogens and carbon dioxide with the carbon with two oxygens. And you reshuffle them and you can make methane, which is four hydrogens and a carbon, ethylene, uh, and a variety, an enormous variety of other uh, chemical substances. And yes, that is a cheeseburger because carbohydrates are one of the, uh, the, the products of this process. But what seems like a simple Lego problem turns out to be mind bogglingly complex. We know it's possible because plants uh, and other living organisms have been doing this for over 3 billion years. Uh, and they are, after all, the ultimate source of fossil fuels. But they don't do it very efficiently. Yet, in spite of all the public and private investments over the years in work by some of the smartest scientists on the planet, numerous Nobel uh, Prizes, finding a practical way to reproduce, let alone improve on the basic process of converting water and carbon dioxide into complex chemicals has proven maddeningly elusive. Next slide. But this is rapidly changing in a large part for reasons uh, Ed has already hinted. Uh, there have been spectacular advances in unexpected areas, including electrochemistry, synthetic biology, artificial intelligence, material science, and many other areas that uh, have in significantly increased the likelihood of success. We now have a wealth of potential approaches for uh, converting water and CO2 into, into complex chemicals, and they include uh, using uh, advanced uh, catalysts to, to capture uh, what we hope will be inexpensive uh, hydrogen and CO2 and combine it with CO2, electrochemical cells that can use uh, water and uh, that can use, uh, again, commercial low-cost hydrogen and combine it with uh, carbon dioxide as, as inputs, and then electrochemical cells that can uh, you directly convert water and carbon dioxide in a single cell. This can be, again, powered by electricity or by direct sunlight, which is called uh, artificial photosynthesis. You can use uh, engineered microorganisms using a variety of inputs to uh, produce these, uh, which can be fed both uh, hydrogen and carbon dioxide. You can have combinations of electrochemical devices and microorganisms. And you can even use uh, fuel cells running in reverse that uh, convert electricity into fuels. You'll hear about a number of these uh, in, in later in this uh, this session. But one interesting feature that most of them share is that they are in arrays of comparatively small devices, meaning that you can get on a virtuous cycle of design, build, test, fail, and improve 
you don't need a billion dollar plant uh, to uh, uh, test the concept. Next slide. But while it's clear that uh, the technology is uh, racing ahead, US policy uh, has failed to keep pace with the opportunities. Uh, this is less true in uh, Asia and Europe. One reason, of course, is that the cost of the uh, feedstocks for plastics and other petrochemicals are much more expensive there. Uh, but Europe has it has an aggressive program for producing direct production, including fairly large, very large scale uh, demonstrations. Next slide. But the U.S. has uh, clear uh, advantages that it needs to build on. It's got a very strong research uh, infrastructure, a universities, corporate research. Uh, it's got a world leading research in a lot of the key uh, technologies involved. We've got a good track record of moving ideas into enterprise. And we also now have some resources through uh, recent legislation and uh, and increased funding for uh, the programs in the Department of Energy that you're going to hear about uh, later. Next slide. Uh, so what's been what the potential impact that uh, of these systems uh, is so significant that I will argue that there should be a major national initiative focused on meeting, meeting these goals and its own earth shot. And the core issue is not whether the conversion is possible, because we know biological systems have been doing this for billions of years. The issue is whether we can do it at an affordable price in a practical way. This turns out to be a daunting challenge, but the Europeans have clearly embraced this challenge, setting an ambitious 23 goal. Next slide. It turns out that trying to keep track of the work in this area is, is incredibly difficult since the pace of change is so rapid and so many independent research in, uh, communities are involved. Federal and corporate research is uh, leading to breakthroughs in many areas, some of them focused directly on energy applications and others, as Ed explained, uh, that will make major contributions uh, even though energy was not their original intent. But what's been lacking is a comprehensive review of the research and a detailed road plan uh, and roadmap for moving ahead and building on the extraordinary uh, technical resources that are being developed. What's also missing is a coherent way to measure the net environmental impact of the petrochemicals uh, uh, production, including all three of the stages that I described earlier. Uh, because we, unless we've got a, an agreed metric on the net environmental impact, uh, we're not going to be able to develop decent procurement policies and, and other incentives. Next. So I'm going to leave with one essential question, and that is what inventions could radically change the likelihood of meeting climate goals? Now, fusion springs to mind, but it certainly seems that a practical method for converting air and water into useful chemicals would make the list. And I'm willing to bet that given adequate to support making petrochemicals without petrol is more likely to be affordable in the next two decades. So thank you. Look forward to questions. Super. Thanks, Henry. Um, very illustrative. Uh, let's bring up now Ellie. Okay. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Or, um, uh, my name is El Ellie Simon, Elfide Simon from Siemens Energy. Uh, company and I would like to add something what uh, Henry already said and brought up what could be some solutions to um, help to have new technologies to produce chemical fuels in the future without any fossil resources and this is why I would like to introduce you to our different programs of innovative electrolyzer technologies for and one example for CO2 electrolysis. So please, next slide. I just want to introduce you to Siemens Energy. Uh, we are targeted to support our customer along the whole energy value chain. We have different big businesses around that. This is the gas service business and the wind turbine business. Then for transport and storage of energy, the grid technology, which is very 
important business, even if we have new renewable energies into the system to cope with all inconsistencies there. And then the transformation of industry, it's really targeting that what I would like to present further on, reducing greenhouse gas emissions with new technologies, for example, water electrolyzer or CO2 electrolyzer. Next slide, please. And this is why we brought up in the last year our four, five fields of action. So what does it mean? We really focusing besides our general businesses, as I presented in the last slide, to focus more on really what is needed for greenhouse gas emission to make to support defossilization, decarbonization, and what are the new solutions and new technologies for the future to cope with the climate chain and to bring to our customer new technologies to, for that they can use fossil uh, sources usage and have possibilities for renewables. So these are our five field of actions. So the one is decarbonized heat and industrial processes. What does it mean? We are coping with heat pumps and looking at how can we improve industrial processes from the energy standpoint of view. Then we are really targeting to go into energy storage. You are, I think, quite aware that if we are producing a lot of renewable energies from sun, from wind, then we have to store it somewhere and near to where it was generated or near to where it has to be used. And one of our topic, which I would like to go much more deeper here into this session is the power to X. What does it mean? We convert renewable energy into a high value chemical, into a hydrogen, into ethylene or something similar. Then our fourth, okay. Please step back. <laughs> the resilient grids, grids and reliability. So this is our fourth field of action and condition-based services and intervention for industrial uh, management, energy management solutions. This is quite of IT solutions, how to be more energy efficient in existing systems. Then next slide. When we look into power to X means renewable convert renewable energy into mainly in our businesses currently, this is hydrogen. You see here a sketch. So we are active in producing renewable energy with wind uh, businesses and in classical uh, energy uh, power supply. Then in you feed your ele green electrons into the grid and then we have there, for example, uh, water electrolyzer. What we are pursuing is our PEM water electrolysis convert um, green electricity into hydrogen for storage, or we can further convert it with carbon dioxide, maybe to high value chemicals like methanol, which can be applied in industry, in mobility, or even used for re electrification. Next slide, please. And for that, I would like to introduce one of our highlights we are pursuing currently since several years. It's a very big pro pilot project currently in, in the Magellan area. It's called Haru Oni. It's the first integrated plant for climate neutral um, fuel production from wind and water. What do we want to do there? We want to install big uh, wind parks and why do we do that because there is a lot of wind and we have a lot of hours throughout the years to produce renewable wind electricity and then feed it into a water electrolyzer our PEM electrolyzer which is the next step we use the hydrogen then further for a methanol plant to produce um, CO2 neutral methanol and then use for example the methanol for ship motors or for any other purposes or convert it further to really electrical fuel like gasoline or diesel or kerosene. Our partners are there, um, highly innovative fuels, they add 
AF, Porsche, so automotive producer, then the country is Chile, cl quite clear, and the SIP production and the PEM electrolyzer, this is what is our part to do that. We want to look at that to see what are how, what can we learn from that we want to produce their e-methanol e and methanol has a very quite um, decent uh, logistic worldwide so it's it's not so difficult to transport for example methanol from chile to somewhere in europe or somewhere in in the other worlds and uh, we have here a three-step approach we want to go for a first demonstrator with five uh, seven hundred fifty thousand liters of emethanol then the next scale up is for more than 55 million liters of emethanol and then for 550 mil uh, mil million liters of methanol or e-fuel in in the future so we see here there a really big chance to do that uh, to show case what is possible when we are having this kind of um, process pathways. When we go to the next slide, another big program is also our CO2 electrolysis, where we directly convert CO2 with an electrochemical system, either to carbon monoxide or to hydrocarbons. And the idea is really then to use it somewhere in the industry, transport energy or in the chemical industry and then if the co2 is somewhere emitted we capture it and feed it back to the system so we have so such a kind of circle economy next slide please one of our uh, former project was exactly what you can see here we converted co2 with an electrochemical system to carbon monoxide this was the first step to produce a kind of syngas and then feed it into a fermentation system which could be uh, could produce then high value chemicals for example butanol or hexanol and this was done together with a partner. So we have uh, converted two, two big partners, Siemens and Evonik, uh, to do that and showcase that. And on the next slide, you see the showcase we have done. We have uh, shown that this can be done in a kind of first small demonstrator where we have shown that this is possible to convert CO2 to carbon monoxide and then feed it into fermentation to really produce new and carbon neutral um, chemicals next slide please another one is we want to look at that what is much more maybe more efficient if we convert co2 with the electrochemical system directly to ethylene as feedstock and then convert it further in a oligomerization process to fuels or to fuel precursor but you may be aware, quite aware ethylene can also as a molecule be used directly in the chemical industry for polymers and plastic production. Next slide. So, and then this is the big overview to say, okay, how can electrochemical systems or electrochemical technology help us to bring water, CO2 and uh, into chemicals and fuels for the future. It can be done, this is from our point of view, with, with a water electrolyzer or directly converting CO2 to carbon monoxide or hydrocarbons. And then my last slide. Uh, so I would like to conclude that really electrochemical conversion can be used and can be the technology driver for defossilization because we have seen that for in small scale we can produce high value chemical there. Um, this uh, can produce chemical feedstocks and uh, if they have maybe uh, a one step approach a higher efficiency then this, this counts uh, using the um, green electrons in a very efficient way. Uh, this could become a an, an new business opportunities also for companies like Siemens Energy to have new business opportunities in the context of power to x But the competition, I would say, is still open, which process pathway is the really one 
which count the most efficient will win or there will be room for different ones. And then I would like to thank for your attention and head over to Ed. Um, Ellie, that was fantastic. Uh, thanks for illustrating both of those, um, methanol and ethylene, uh, some of the biggest uh, commodity chemicals that are out there. So they're certainly foundational to the industry. So with that, uh, let's bring up Ram. Thanks, Ed. Uh, if, um, I'm with 12, I'm the chief commercial officer, 12's uh, Bay Area, California startup, uh, uh, which has been around for a few years, but uh, we're now active in the market. Uh, next slide, please. And, and our thesis, our uh, vision is indeed to break that cycle of using uh, petroleum uh, fossil fuels to make uh, petrochemicals and other materials and fuels, and to use existing uh co2 emissions or a co2 in the air to convert it into those same products uh identical in in in, in structure to the uh, to existing products so it could be used as a drop-in and we think uh, it's not only our uh, mission our vision is that we can we can it's it's a business opportunity and we can it's a trillion dollar opportunity and we uh, our company is aimed at sort of harnessing that opportunity uh next slide please We've been around for a few years now, uh, founded by um, leaders in, in electrochemistry. So Kendra and Itasha did their PhDs at Stanford uh, together in the, the same group. Uh, and uh, Nicholas, our CEO, is, is also at Stanford. We've uh, raised at well over 200 million uh, in the last uh, couple of years. Um, and uh, we are now a pretty large team of 275 people uh, mostly based in Berkeley in uh, California. Um, you'll see some of the uh, folks who funded us, DCVC and Capricorn, a couple of their venture capital companies. Uh, but you also will see some of the labs that helped us get to this point. Next slide, please. Our underlying technology is uh, indeed uh, polymer electrolyte membranes, PEM technology. Um, and uh, it's industrial photosynthesis as we see it. So that, that what you see there in that picture is, a, is, a, is, is, is one of those membranes with the black uh, stuff being what's coated on it. So the core technology takes CO2 and water and electricity and uh, converts it into products in oxygen, uh, much the same as a plant would do, except it's not starch we're producing. And, so this is uh, industrial photosynthesis uh, that Henry referred to as well. On the next slide, uh, you'll see that um, we could make CO and then syngas, which itself has a very large uh, uh, market. And, and then in the, uh, we've shown that our underlying um, uh, platform can also make ethylene, uh, which Ellie referred to as well. But our focus currently is the blue dot. So start with carbon monoxide and syngas and, and then make products from that. We'll come back to ethylene once uh, we, we've sort of commercialized uh, the, the first product. Um, next slide, please. So our what we've been focusing on is to convert that CO2 using renewable power to CO, uh, add um, hydrogen uh, to it uh, to make uh, through Fischer-Tropsch synthesis to make both jet fuel and um, naphtha. And then uh, th that naphtha obviously could go to, uh, is the feedstock that goes into most uh, petrochemicals. We also obviously could provide syngas and make chemicals directly from syngas. Uh, indeed, we've worked with uh, Lanza Tech on uh, sort of a fermentation route from making syngas into ethylene and uh, propylene. Uh, but so there are many routes here. And, and the good thing about it is that the chemicals we make or the products we make, there is three kilograms of uh, CO2 that uh, go into both the um, more than three kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of jet fuel or naphtha. So for uh, every kilogram of naphtha we produce, we've taken out three kilograms of CO2 in the, in, in the world, in the atmosphere. Uh, we use the word CO2 made uh, for, as a trademark for our uh, uh, products for, uh, in the petrochemical products. If we move on to the next slide, 
we've already done that on a proof of concept basis. We made uh, some jet uh, sustainable aviation fuel, what we call GE jet, both for the Air Force and we have some contracts to supply Alaska Airlines and Microsoft. We've made some solid ingredients that went into uh, detergents for uh, Procter & Gamble for Tide. We made some uh, auto parts uh, for Mercedes Benz, uh, both uh, stuff that goes into the seat, but also some harder plastics and, and also some fun stuff. We've made some sunglasses under the Pangaea uh, uh, brand. And where we are now is, uh, is trying to take this forward and commercialize these technologies we're building our first plant uh, out in Washington state currently, which will take um, uh, renewable hydropower and uh, biogenic CO2 and convert it both into uh, jet fuel and naphtha. And uh, we're marketing that e-naphtha uh, to the petrochemical companies, but also these downstream consumers who could then uh, use that naphtha to make uh, green end products that uh, consumers use. If we move to the next slide. The you'll see that if you start off with fossil naphtha, just the, uh, the sourcing of the feedstock, and then the process of making naphtha through, you know, in a refinery or some other process is uh, generate CO2. Um, but then what uh, our process does is because we use a lot of CO2 to make the naphtha, even if there's a little bit of emissions in capturing that CO2 and transforming it. Um, net, we would uh, cradle to gate, we would use 2.7 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of naphtha we, we produce. And if you look at the difference, it's, as I said, over three tons of CO2 for every ton of uh, naphtha we produce. And so that then gets translated into a carbon negative uh products produced from the naphtha um it may get diluted a bit based on how much energy is needed to process the naphtha into few into uh, products and what kind of energy is used but the in, intent is to start off with a feedstock that is significantly carbon um, negative so as i said co2 electrolysis combined with water electrolysis uh to synthesize using uh, fossil, uh, using uh, renewable power into making uh, naphtha and uh, into um, hydrocarbon products. I think the interesting thing that um, I guess Henry commented on is there's a lot of support in the, uh, in the government for hydrogen and for electricity, um, which is all very good. But I think, uh, you know, our world runs on hydrocarbons. Uh, hydro you can't make a plastic just with hydrogen. Um, or with just renewable power. And, and so I think that the carbon part of it, converting the, the existing CO2 in the world into the carbon that goes into the hydrocarbons is uh, the next step. Um, and that's important. And as Henry says, needs to be more supported by um, the regulators, uh, both in the US and, and elsewhere. And our vision, if you go to the next slide, is that we would be taking out as much CO2 in millions of tons a year as a large fossil fuel-based oil company today. Um, that's what we'd like to be in, in a decade. And we are on our way to uh, doing that. That's my last slide. Um, I'm happy to turn it back over to Ed. Uh, Ram, that was excellent as well. Uh, thanks for making the connection to Henry's comment relative to photosynthesis and uh, connecting to industrial uh, photosynthesis. And I'll note that uh, the hurdle for this should not be high relative to the chemical industry. The foundation of the chemical industry more than 100 years ago uh, was electrochemistry. So glad to see it being utilized in this case for a really creative uh, use of uh, carbon in the atmosphere. So with that, let's turn it over to uh, Felicia. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, so uh, uh, I'm Felicia Lucci. Um, so I'm with the Industrial Efficiency and Decarbonization Office. We are one of the new offices in DOE. Um, if folks were familiar with 
AMO of the Advanced Manufacturing Office. Uh, we sort of AMO evolved now into two new offices. And really that's to kind of show the importance of, I think, this area of industrial decarbonization. Um, so today, yeah, I thought I would take some time to sort of, you know, kind of, um, you know, we see, you know, the sustainable feedstocks as a, a very key piece of decarbonizing the chemical sector. Um, and I thought maybe as the sort of last presentation today, I was sort of kind of put in context as to sort of where uh, sort of sustainable feedstocks are fitting into our overall uh, uh, strategy to decarbonize, you know, this sector. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, I think as Ed highlighted at the beginning, you know, uh, the you know, as we're working for like a carbon neutral economy wide decarbonization, you know, the chemical sector is going to be key. And that's because it is the largest emitting sector um, within the industrial sector. Um, but it also has a very significant um, footprint um, in sort of in terms of the economics in the US. And so, you know, it can be attributed to about 25% of the US GDP. Um, but maybe some statistics that, you know, aren't as familiar to the audiences. You know, I think when we think about the manufacturing uh, footprint, we recently sort of did a, a you know, a, a rough uh, look at sort of all the US chemical companies. And we, we want to understand sort of where their uh, manufacturing footprint was. And we actually discovered about 20 to 30 percent of, you know, U.S. based chemical companies have about 20 to 30 percent of their manufacturing here in the United States. So, you know, it is a fairly significant sort of uh, source of, of jobs and um and revenue within the US. And then the other thing though is often when we're thinking about chemical companies, we're thinking about these very large, highly integrated companies, which is true. Um, but there's also um, about 30% of the companies are small businesses. And so this kind of speaks to sort of the heterogeneity of the sector and sort of, you know, you know it, it, it is, it's not just one solution, but it's gonna be multiple solutions to decarbonize this sector. Uh, next slide, please. So a lot of you might be already familiar with this, but to sort of kind of uh, set their strategy at the Department of Energy for decarbonization, we released our industrial decarbonization roadmap. And this looked at the high, highest emitting sectors, which were iron and steel, cement, chemicals, petroleum refining, and food and beverage. And what it did was looking across all five of these sectors, it identified sort of four strategies for decarbonization or four pillars. And there's our energy efficiency, industrial electrification, low carbon fuels, feedstocks, and energy sources, which is sort of aligned with our conversations today, and then carbon capture utilization and storage, which also brings in the piece of the CO2 utilization as a sustainable feedstock. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so with that, um, I really, you know, so what are we thinking about in AIDO specifically? So we're thinking about how do we decarbonize the high volume energy emission intensive chemicals? Um, and so there's there's roughly sort of 70, to, depending on, on the source, there's roughly about 70 chemicals um, that are high volume, energy intensive and have high emissions. So, you know, it's a fairly large swath of chemicals and it's really your commodities, you know, your ethylenes, um, ammonias that you think about that. And so we're looking at trying to identify what technologies are going to be the most impactful for sort of ambitious decarbonization and ambitious reductions in sort of greenhouse gas emissions, particularly uh, CO2. Um, and when we say ambitious, lately we've been thinking about technologies that are going to have a 50 to even 85 percent reduction in CO2 emissions. Um, so shown here is sort of I think all the technologies that we're sorry to, that we're thinking about for chemical sector decarbonization. We're thinking about this at multiple levels within you know sort of the supply chain. We're thinking at the most basic sense. We're thinking about the unit operations or within the individual manufacturing systems and then we want to go up also thinking about the, the production and the facility systems and then also everything be outside the plant boundaries and how do these all interact for decarbonization um, and when we look at sort of the manufacturing systems these are really your union operations your advanced reactors your advanced separations and so these you know development of not only sort of the, the technologies to sort of um, you know, these are going to be the development of the technologies to convert, you know, sort of your sustainable feedstocks into sort of, you know, your end chemical products. When we get up to the next level, up to the sort of facility system, we're really thinking about how do we have, you know, we manage the sustainable use of energy and resource utilization. So we're thinking about how, how do we sort of utilize low carbon process heating? How do we think about things like industrial electrification, as well as sort of how do we sort of recover the heat within a facility? And then when we get beyond that, we need to think about the inputs that are going into the facility. So electrification, we need to be thinking about, you know, sort of decarbonized grid to realize CO2 reduction or GHG and GHG reductions um, when we electrify. You know, we're also thinking about the use of low carbon fuels, things like hydrogen, sort of bio-based uh, fuels. Um, and then finally, I think what we're talking about 
today is sustainable feedstock. So, you know, so at, in Aido and at the D, at DOE, we're thinking all different types of sustainable feedstocks. We're thinking about biomass, which include things like municipal solid waste, starch, and lignans. We're thinking about uh, CO2, which was already talked about today. We're also thinking about how do we sort of recycle and reuse plastics that are out there. And then also things like renewable natural gas, um, hydrogen, and hydrogen. Um, and so with that, next slide, please. Yeah, so I did just kind of want to sort of highlight if, you know, if you want to connect, please, sir, subscribe. We have, you know, to, to sort, sort of our new leather to keep in touch or feel free to reach out. Um, and, and, and sort of kind of ending on commercial, we did last night actually release the most recent funding opportunity to come out of DOE. So this is going to be focusing on R&D for sort of uh, looking at sort of mid-range TRL technologies. Um, in, in sort of the emitting sector. So there is a entire topic developed dedicated to the chemical sector, which is encouraging the use of sort of sustainable feedstocks. Um, but then there's also quite a few cross-cutting technologies as well that are relevant uh, to the petrochemical and the chemical sector. Um, and so with that, yeah, I think I'll thank, thank Ed. Okay, fantastic. Uh, thanks, Felicia. Um, so let's turn to some uh, audience uh, questions at this point. Um, one I'll ask is, as you, as you look at uh, the history of CO2 activation or um, perhaps CO, uh, one of the questions that typically comes up is how efficient would be the process, uh, particularly at, at low temperatures, uh, to avoid the high temperature activation that's needed uh, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, the efficiency and um, where that stands and where the U.S. sits relative to the landscape of other competitors? Uh, let me start with Ram and then maybe I'll go to Ellie and then, and then Henry. Yeah, uh, thanks, Ed, for that question. Um, the, the chemical conversion of uh, CO2 into CO and further on by adding hydrogen to it, uh, so what some folks call a reverse water gas shift, uh, which is that's done at high temperatures and and has the the issues of being able to you know scale the uh, the the technology the high temperatures that are necessary to avoid things like methane formation, uh, but at low temperatures we don't have any of those the which is what um, the technology that Ellie talked about and I talked about which is uh, PEM electrolysis those are lower temperatures we don't have those same issues. The, both from an efficiency standpoint and uh, from um, you know mass manufacturing standpoint, so capital as well, they have some advantages uh, compared to some of these high temperature technologies. That said, uh, the efficiency isn't quite there in terms of where we are in development. I'd say we're probably at uh, nor just north of 50% efficiency, but we hope to get it to like uh, say 70 thereabouts in terms of percent efficiency, thermodynamic efficiency, which is where water electrolysis these days seem to have gotten to. So we are still uh, have some R&D work to do on our side. Um, but we still think it's better than chemical conversion, chemical reduction of CO2. Uh, electrochemical is better, we think. Hi, uh, Ellie, pick it up from there. Yes, uh, just remarks from my, I, I can completely agree to RAM because we are working on a similar technology, low temperature CO2 electrolyzers and exactly that uh, on the one hand, exactly we, we are really just targeting at efficiency. So efficiency uh, has different aspects. It's, it's the temperature if you have low temperature. So this is, we do not have this high temperature processes and exactly scaling and um, and manufacturing is is the topic we are also focusing at and this is why we decided to go for low temperature co2 uh, conversion um, exactly and uh, what we are really have to work on and I completely uh, admit uh, can um, say the same that ramp the so efficiency at low temperature has to be improved uh, to make it uh, to come to a commercial applications and but we see really potentials to come to similar ones than we have seen for water electrolysis for PEM water electrolysis where we are at the 80 80 percent so we are targeting that for CO2 electrolysis, directly conversion to ethylene to hydrocarbons. It's a little bit more 
complex because we are uh, addressing, uh, we are producing more chemicals than only one, not only ethylene, but this is still a research topic and we are looking at that to make it much more efficient, to have better catalysts, to have better electrodes and all this different components which can be improved in the future. We are quite convinced of that. Uh, Henry, any comments to add? A um, couple of things. Uh, first, the obvious point that plants are able to make these conversions at room temperature very well, thank you. Uh, they're probably only about 1% efficient in doing it, and that's way low, uh, way below the thermodynamic uh, potential. Uh, most of the economic analyses that, you, that have been done show very plainly you need two things. One, very high efficiency and very cheap electricity to make these uh, competitive. Now, the, one of the dilemmas is that the uh, these technologies are so diverse that it's been very hard to get a, a comparable economic analysis of, of these things. And it's one thing that I would hope that would come out of a coherent national program and, and, and roadmap. Uh, one final thing is that uh, some of these technologies take one of the more intractable uh, steps, which is capturing and processing the carbon and make that uh, a biological step. And instead of use, so you combine electrochemical with, uh, to uh, produce the hydrogen with a biological system to capture the carbon. Uh, the interesting thing is that there are a lot of different things in play and that's, that is very good news. Uh, just a quick follow up on that. One of the big challenges typically with some of these uh, chemical processes is separation. Uh, so the question I, I guess I'll put out there is how do you see these processes relative to their um, selectivity uh, to get the uh, desired reaction product and to avoid all the downstream separations issues where, uh, as Felicia might note, uh, process heat comes into play. Uh, let's see, maybe I'll start with uh, Ram on that one and then Ellie. Yeah, uh, separation, I mean, we, we see pretty good selectivity to, to produce the product we want. It's more the conver single pass conversions that uh, will re do result in the need for separations. You still have a lot of CO2 coming out uh, at, at the back end. Yes, uh, but well, integrated with things like downstream processes, for instance, fissure troughs or uh, synthesis, there is enough heat to go around that with a good job of integrating, you could find the heat that you need for some of these separation processes. So there is, and we have some uh, intellectual property in that area around trying to also develop, uh, in, you know, process integration ideas around making sure we use the heat properly to, to effect that separation. But again, that's an area that will improve. Single pass conversions, we hope to get to it much better. Um, I think, you know, some of the processes we use don't, don't really mind if you have a little bit of other stuff, but if you need a high purity source of carbon monoxide, uh, for instance, to make fast gene and then some downstream chemicals, then some of those separations need to be uh, fine tuned and you need really high purity product that could get a bit expensive. But I think to make the, the kind of stuff we're doing, uh, it works just fine. Uh, Ellie. Yeah. Um, yes. Downs. Uh, downstream separation, gas separation, liquid separation uh, is a topic. We are also looking at that, not not mostly with partners because we are not the, the ones who are dealing with gases and, 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 and liquids, but exactly we have to look at that and look at how efficient we can do that. So uh, we see um, the potential to improve the electrolyzer technology to make it more selective. Uh, re in regards to the product we want to use and in in a whole system like we in this different process pathways where we have for example thermocatalytic um, processes where we generate a lot of heat we have seen when we do some calculations around techno economics that we can use it somewhere in the electrolyzer or even because we also need the CO2 if it, if it comes from direct air capture, then it could have benefit uh, that it makes economic to also to use direct air capture, for example, if we have surplus of, of heat in the whole process chain until we have this uh, hydrocarbons and, and chemicals. So we have to look at each of the process pathways and components in that very carefully 
and look at that also from a techno-economic analysis standpoint to which which process pathway is the most efficient and most economic? Um, well, that's certainly um, area of interest for the petrochemical industry because uh, that type of process optimization and integration is their mm -hmm. bread and butter. So yes. um, once you get down to the basics, finding ways to make it more efficient is something that the industry knows very, very well. Let's take a policy question and uh, I'll turn to Felicia for this one. And that is, you know, given the landscape of what our speakers have, have talked about um, and what you had mentioned, Felicia, relative to some of the offerings in the DOE space, uh, where do you see the, the needs for uh, policy and R&D uh, to come in and support these types of uh, innovations? Yeah, so I, I think I think so much from like the technology development standpoint, I think some of it is reflected in what DOE has been doing recently, you know, through, you know, the bill and the IRA uh, funding. And, you know, we do need to be thinking about how do we scale and demonstrate these technologies. So I think that's that's, you know, I think that's a a key area and then also thinking about sort of investing so through the loan program office sort of how do we invest in sort of these first of a kind demonstrations and how do we start sort of showing and proving that that these things are are capable um and then the other kind of piece too i i think you know i think the reality of the situation is you know we're thinking about very large very expensive processes right with significant capital investment and so you know we do you know i think at doe our challenge right now is how do we prioritize right and how do we think about the impacts and you know, sort of, you know, sort of, there's a lot of technology options out there, but sort of thinking about how do we prioritize the technology pathways and, and, and sort of coupling that with the, the impacts and thinking about what's going to be the first sort of movers in the market um, to sort of start reducing sort of the react, the carbon right now, as well as sort of in the future and down the, down, down the line. Okay. Thanks for that, uh, Felicia. Um, I'll also ask a, another question for you to kind of start with, and that is, um, well, uh, actually, maybe I'll, I'll start with Ellie on, on this one, and uh, and then you can chime in, and that's the, the story of, of economics. So we've heard people talk about the green premium, the cost of what a low-carbon technology might be compared to the incumbent. Realizing it's really early stage, where do you see the prospects um, for these types of processes getting to relative to that premium and uh, approaching the incumbent solution. Uh, Ellie, you want to take a first shot at that and we'll go to Felicia. Yes, thanks Ed for that question. Uh, I really think that we need uh, at the beginning or when we are coming to the first product that we need a premium. Uh, when we are looking currently uh, for um, uh, electrochemical uh, uh, synthesized ethylene, we are currently comparing that with bioethylene. Bioethylene also has a higher price than fossil-based ethylene. And to see if if there is, is a kind of market or a price target we, we can focus on and, and, and calculate. So I, I think when we cannot use the prices mm -hmm. For, for example, for ethylene, for, for black or brown ethylene. So we have to compare with something else. So this is my, for example, the biomolecules we are currently have already in the market. This is what we are looking at. And also for carbon monoxide, it, it, it should have a higher price because we need this, as I said, this different process steps and the whole process chain and all costs money and energy and efficiency. So um, we, uh, we could imagine a scenario that this the prices of the green or uh, E molecules are, are high or comparable to, for example, bio and uh, the fossil based are, are also in, are, have prices step by step in the future higher because of CO2 certifications or CO2 certificates that then become to a comparable or competitive situation with the green or um, green molecules. Okay, super. Any other comments on the, on the green premium? Yeah. Uh and if I could add to that, uh, I agree with Ali that, you know, the, the benchmark we now have is bio, for instance, for naphtha would be bio naphtha, which sells for two to three times what fossil naphtha sells. 
but I don't think uh, we'll will it'll cost that much uh, using renewable power, especially with the incentives that are available in the um, IRA. Um, I think that that helps us, especially on the hydrogen side, um, because of the significant incentives. So with the incentives, we we certainly can be compatible with bio naphtha, but it's still a premium over fossil naphtha today is what we could produce at, uh, and that'll go down quickly. I mean, we're still in the uh, we're still early uh, stages of going down that cost curve. So I, I fully expect that uh, by the uh, end of this decade, we can get uh, much closer to fossil naphtha and maybe close the gap between fossil naphtha through the CO2 cost of fossil naphtha. Super. Um, Henry, any add to that? Uh, <clears throat> no, I think that the... Uh... Economics are going to depend on the uh, on, on policy as much as anything else. Uh, getting complete cost parity with extremely cheap U.S. natural gas is going to be very hard, uh, with unless there is some kind of a, a carbon penalty. Uh, mm. One thing I would like to emphasize, though, on the uh, is this idea of of scale. Uh, I think that these facilities are going to look much more like large photovoltaic plants than billion dollar petrochemical facilities and that they will be uh, modular and that they can be built up. And I think that that has a tremendous opportunity for continuous improvement. Uh, and <clears throat> so that the other thing is that the, uh, the biological systems, uh, that's, they are, uh, need to be scaled up but they the scale up there is getting large fermentation tanks and i think someone asked quickly about uh, synthetic biology these things can be engineered to do extraordinary things if you feed them cheap glucose they can make ethylene directly through this synthesis uh, the question is of course where does the glucose come from um, and but i think that the, you know the, co the cost reduction is the key r d challenge of all of this stuff and that really hinges mm -hmm. largely on efficiency, uh, both of the biological and the uh, electrochemical system. Uh, yeah, Henry, that's that's certainly a point to, to hit hard, and that is that the cost is going to be one of the prime factors relative to adoption and displacement of what's currently in the marketplace. So indeed, cost uh, performance is going to be crucial. Uh, let's end with a, a question that um, uh, it deals with small and medium-sized manufacturers. And the question is, Felicia, how do you see uh, the ability of small and medium-sized manufacturers to participate uh, in this electrochemical revolution? And also, what connections would that have to the social aspects um, connected with manufacturer, manufacturing and, and helping the people aspects in this space? Yeah, so actually my, my response to this question is actually very similar to my response um, for that would have been for the prior question as well. So kind of tailing it, I think we're small businesses and sort of also how we're going to address sort of this cost parity is really thinking about what are going to be the initial markets and the profits margin. And Ali kind of commented on this too, you know, thinking about, you know, the specialty chemicals that have a larger profit margin, you know, they might be the place to start sort of showing that the, 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 the technology and showing it's commercial. And so then also thinking about the idea of sort of creating a material that also has co-benefits, right? So, you know, it has, um, you know, you know, better me mechanical properties, you know, sort of uh, better, you know, electrical properties, whatever the property is that's of interest, you know, to the application space. And so I think those are two places that are going to help with the cost question. And I think those are two places where the small businesses are agile and can sort of innovate and think about sort of, you know, how can their product and their technology sort of add additional benefit. Um, and then I think, yeah, kind of you're tying it back to kind of like you said, the sort of the, the, the community benefits and the social benefits. I think a lot of these technologies we're talking about, you know, whether it's the CO2 electrolyzers or biomanufacturing, you know, they have a lower sort of physical footprint in terms of sorry they they require less temperature less heating and I, I think that's also and I think like Henry mentioned modular that's also going to sort of I think help with sort of the the the, the physical uh, footprint of a manufacturing facility and, and then sort of how the impact that that has on, on on the external community when we're thinking about water resources and um and those kind of things 
Okay, I think we got time for just one more uh, comment. So let me kick it back to, to Ram uh, relative to policy. Yeah, uh, I think thanks, Ed. Uh, uh, also with Felicia on the uh, pa panel, I, I did say you know lovely things about the IRA, but the one thing I think that the IRA does is incentivize sticking CO2 underground more than it does utilizing CO2. And I think that um, the the 45Q, and that's an area where I think we could change that. We should encourage utilizing CO2 more than um, sequestering it, because that's one uh, uh, way we could kickstart this thing. And there is a difference there. I'd also say that, you know, we support hydrogen uh, more than the production of CO and CO water electrolysis highly supported. There are also policies statewide and everywhere with uh, with for fuels, low carbon fuel standards as an example in California. Don't have the same things for petrochemicals. So it's a bit of a foster child. And I think that's sort of what Henry was alluding to and the whole uh, purpose of this webinar as well, or panelists to try to push uh, those policies as well. Yeah, Ram, excellent point. And uh, put the emphasis on carbon um, connects with the petrochemical and Henry's early mm -hmm. comments on the connectivity of, of carbon. And although 45Q has got some aspects that will uh, help, uh, the relative level of incentives uh, could really be bumped up. So uh, making something useful uh, out of the carbon uh, is valued more than sticking it into the ground. So with that, let me thank our speakers. Let me thank Henry for an excellent report. And there's a lot more information there for people to, to digest off of the ITIF uh, website. Uh, and with that, we'll wrap and thank everyone for their attention, for their interest, uh, and again, uh, the speakers for their participation. Thank you.